Perfumery 101. This is the subject of this week's Tuesday's podcast. This is from a free ebook actually that I wrote um, in 2022. Sounds like ages ago, but it's only like two years ago. Anyway, I wrote an ebook. It's free. I'm going to put the link in the description so you can download it. But this book is about 22 points that will set you off on the right path um, for your perfumery journey. Now, if you are new to the world of perfumery or even aromatherapy, this is going to apply to you. And these are some of the points that I wish people would have told me all those years ago when I started out on my own fragrant journey. And it's not a frou-frou book, and this is not a frou-frou podcast filled with frilly nonsense that is an attempt to learn you into the industry and to go and buy any of my courses. Um, I'm known for being a truth teller. I tell it like it is. Sometimes what I say is a bit harsh, but it's like a parent warning a child about danger, and you need to know the truth before you step into this fragrant world. So let's start with the positive stuff. This industry is one of the most fascinating I have ever encountered. I've met some of the most interesting people along the way and forged incredible friendships with like-minded people. Um, And I've done things that I never thought was possible. And my journey over the last 27 years has taken so many twists and turns. It really is like being on the world's longest roller coaster. And sometimes I've been screaming to get off. (laughs) And sometimes I've been screaming with the thrill of the ride. Um, Back in 97, I was actually waxing armpits and bikini lines. And when I was doing that, I never thought that one day, for even a second, that I would make a perfume for Carlsberg or create perfume workshops for companies like Toyota or Mercedes. It never occurred to me that I would host masterclasses in one of the world's most iconic hotels, the Burj Al Arab, and have participants flying in for just a day's masterclass with me at the Burj Al Arab from Thailand, Slovakia... Uh, New York. One guy actually came all the way from New York (laughs) to come and see me. And I said, what is it? What made you come all the way from New York for a perfume masterclass with me? And his name was Carlos. And I said, is it the... Is it the venue? Because the Burj Al Arab, and it was a fantastic pastry arrival, arrivals on refreshments and things, and then an incredible lunch with wine and champagne. Was it the venue? He said, no, it was your face. (laughs) Oh, I don't know how to take that. But anyway, um, that was just so amazing. I never thought that I would ever do that. And today I've taught more than four and a half thousand students all over the world. Of course, most of them remotely. So I have online courses, but I've been incredibly blessed to do what I do. And not everyone is lucky enough to think and to, to pursue their dreams. And I never thought that I would ever do any of these things that I've done. And now I'm writing books. I never thought that I would ever do that. And I was such a bookworm when I was younger. But don't for one second think that any of that was easy. I've cried. I've had meltdowns. I've begged people to attend my events in the early days just to get bums on seats. I used to give free places. I've lost count of the times I've wanted to give up and go and stack shelves in a supermarket. Um, And I didn't want to have to think about my next event or my next launch, but it's the passion that I have for the industry that's always kept me going. And it's the love for my students and my clients that's always pushed me forward. Knowing that I'm helping people to follow their own dreams is actually the best feeling in the world and the highs far outweigh the lows. So here I am telling you the truth about the things you really need to know before you fall down this fragrant rabbit hole. This Perfumery 101 is going to be split into two because otherwise it'll end up being about a 10 hour podcast. (laughs) So uh, we've got 22 points to cover. I'm going to cover 11 today and 11 the next time. Now, where you are on your fragrant journey doesn't really matter. This is going to apply to you, but you might just be starting out and you might start making some aromatherapy blends for maybe just a few private clients or even some friends. But trust me when I tell you that that is just the beginning of your journey because 
there's so much out there for you to possibly do that you have no idea of what you're actually capable of in the future. And you might end up doing some of the things that I have done. So let's get into this now. Without further ado, point number one, know what you're getting into. Perfumery is not that easy and neither is aromatherapy. Let's get that straight. And anyone that tells you otherwise is not telling you the truth. If you don't have a passion for perfumery and you don't love what you do, you will not survive this cutthroat industry. So it's best to get out now and go and find something else to do with your time and your money. It might sound harsh, but it's true. It's hard making perfumes. It's hard finding good suppliers. It's hard sourcing quality materials. It's hard being patient. It's hard finding customers. It's hard marketing yourself. And you will need to dig deep to keep going when things get tough. And they will get tough. Make no mistakes about it. Even if you have the healthiest budget behind you, it's going to be tough. It's hard getting it right. But when you do get it right, oh, wow, the rewards are immeasurable. And it will be that passion for your industry and the love for your craft. That's what's going to keep you going. And know that this journey that you're about to embark upon is akin to being on a roller coaster. And the thrills will either outweigh the fear and the skid marks or you'll want to get off and never go on that fairground ride again. Here's a quote from the iconic perfumer and educator Jean Carles. While it is possible to devise a method which will enable the apprentice perfumer to understand some sort of technique, in perfumery as in many other fields, many will be called but few chosen since the essential qualities which lead to success cannot be taught any more than can be taught enthusiasm, the joy of living and of creating and the love for one's calling. These are innate qualities without which there is no great perfumer. The second point is know that it is going to cost you money to set up your own business. And I've had people that have approached me and said, oh, I want to start my own perfume brand, but I don't want to learn about it. I don't have the budget to take one of your courses. Even a short course of that might be only $99, I don't have the budget to do that and to learn about how to set up my own brand. And my response was, well, if you don't have the budget of $99 to um, to take a short educational course to help you on your way in your journey, then you shouldn't get into this industry because you're going to need a lot more than $99. Um, you need to speculate to accumulate. Perfumery is an incredibly profitable business, but you have to invest in it first. And when you consider the startup costs of your own brand, there's so many variables. So there's raw materials that cost between eight to $50,000 a kilo. Um, and many suppliers have a minimum order quantity of one to 25 kg. And you're not going to be profitable if you're buying small amounts of five mil, 10 mil. It's okay in the beginning if you want to practice to see if this is the industry that you want to get into. But if it's something that it's for your business, you need to start buying wholesale because obviously you'll be much more profitable that way and it's going to cost you more in the long run and you need to factor in obviously shipping costs and then how many materials are you going to need you can buy a starter kit for instance like the la petite la petite parfumerie which is one of my uh, kits it's a non-profit for me and i sell it on the perfumer's apprentice website in the us and they ship it around the world and this is like tiny amounts like 4 mils of uh, 63 high quality raw materials and that's a really good start for people that want to Um, practice and experiment this is by no means for retailing Um, but this is a good start because it's about 200 and I forgot actually it's 200 and something dollars Um, but it's a good way of buying a kit you don't even have to buy that one Um, you know you can buy many other perfume kits uh, for experimenting Um, but that's just the start um, then you're going to need the base, which is alcohol or the oil. And if you make if you're making perfume oils, which you know there's a huge trend towards that now. Uh, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's been around for a long time, but there is um, a lot of people that are going into the perfume oil business for personal or religious 
or even um, for convenience because it's very difficult to ship perfumes over um, overseas if they have alcohol base, but it's much easier if they have a oil base. Um, but the right alcohol, finding the right alcohol is really hard to find. So you must use the right oil that doesn't make your perfume go rancid. So like jojoba oil or fractionated coconut oil, they're the best choices for a longer shelf life. So just know you've got all of these startup costs, but then it's not even about the materials. You've got the bottles and the labeling and the packaging, etc. Um, and, you know, you've got the caps um yeah sure you can buy cheap bottles but are they going to be defective i've been there done that i bought cheap bottles from the perfume souk in dubai um, and they've broken and customers have called me and said my spritz isn't working anymore it got all blocked up um you don't need to have blingy blingy perfume bottles as long as um they're quality um and how are you going to package them are you going to put them in boxes aluminium tins custom made bags canvas bags are you going to have no boxes at all um are you going to have uh, biodegradable boxes? Um, and the perfume industry is notorious for the packaging costing more than the juice itself. And the juice is the industry term for um, the actual neat blend. Um, but the design as well, you need to spend money on design, not just your logo, but your packaging. Then you need labels. You can't just use any old ink and paper from your printer. Um, are you going to have traditional stickers? Trust me, been there, done that. Printed out normal stickers that are not waterproof and then it smudges and then you don't know what it says and they look absolutely awful and it's like how can you command a good price for your perfume when you've got shitty packaging um and so you know you did but then you need to look at what kind are you going to have stickers are you going to have screen printing are you going to have engraving or plates um, and then speaking of design, you need a website uh, to be credible. You absolutely have to have a website so your customers can find you. Um, I never recommend using a Gmail email account either. It just makes you look really unprofessional and it really doesn't cost much to have an email like mine is by MelanieJane.com, MJN at by MelanieJane.com. Um, if it was MJN or the Sense Academy at gmail.com, do you think people and industry professionals would um, take me seriously? I really doubt that. And when it comes to your website, you're going to have to build it. So you're going to have to factor in a budget for that. Are you going to hire a designer to do that? Are you going to hire a designer to do all of your logos, uh, branding and everything to keep it consistent? Um, and I use my, I actually build my own website. I have done for many years. Uh, I use Wix actually to build my websites. It's easy. It's, dra it's drag and drop, uh, copy and paste. It's incredibly easy. And if you get somebody to design your website, well, you know, that's a whole other point we can go into another time, uh, whether you do it yourself or you hire somebody, but that's another uh, cost factor. And then you've got all the equipment that you need. Um, you've got the perfumery scales, whether you decide to get budget ones or you get professional ones, 400 euros upwards uh, for professional perfumery scales, thousands of pipettes, uh, scent strips, stirrers, glass jugs, and so on. So there's a lot of equipment. Now, don't let this put you off right now. It sounds like I'm being a negative ninny. I'm really not. I'm just being realistic and telling you the truth because people will try to fluff over it and go, well, of course you could create a perfume uh, business, you know, for $10, um, you know, just buy my course for $1,200 first and I'll show you how. Um, no, so <laughs> seriously, I've heard these stories. Um Get your spreadsheet out, whether you use Google Docs or you use Microsoft, get a spreadsheet and, you know, spreadsheets are really boring, but very essential. And you need to factor in all your costs before you start, you know, buying stuff um, and getting really excited. Um, and so make a spreadsheet of how much it's going to cost you for all of the equipment, for all of the design, for every single thing that you need right up until the time that you launch a brand. So I'm talking about marketing, PR and, you know, paid ads and things like that. Get a spreadsheet and find out how much it's going to cost you right up until launch day, until the time you're actually going to start spend making money um, and recuperating some of that back. Um, you need a spreadsheet and find out how much it's going to cost you. And it might make you gasp you might end up going and, oh, do you know what? I might go on Dragon's Den and try and get an investor because it's going to cost me too much money. So don't let even the cost put you off, but you need to be aware. You can't just go into it blindly. And my husband taught me many, many years ago. He said, you need to stop thinking of your business as a hobby 
because that's what I was doing in the beginning because I loved it so much and I just wanted to spend my time doing stuff that I wanted to do, you know, like the creating side of it. I didn't want to get into the business side of it at all. That was really boring. I don't want to do accounts and things like that and start going through invoices and receipts. He said, if you keep treating your business as a hobby, you're never going to take it seriously or make money. So get your spreadsheet out. Point number three is do your research. It's one of the first things that you should do before investing any money in your business. You need to know if there's a market for your product and a sustainable consumer demand for what you're about to make. Is the industry growing year on year and what are the projections for growth expected to be? And Google will be your best friend. You can even use, um, I wouldn't use chat GTP actually for that because it's not up to date. It's normally about 18 months behind, but do research on Google and have a look at industry publications as well. But yeah, the perfume industry is growing year on year. So but you need to have a look at current and future trends as well so you can be ahead of the game. But don't latch on to gimmicks. Fads fade quickly and you'll be stuck with something outdated. So make your brand and your products current but timeless and find out who your competitors are and what do they offer. And then you need to find your tribe. Who is your customer? Where are they? And are there enough of them to build a viable business? You might focus on, let's say, locally, uh, initially and then start regionally and then go internationally and then globally but start small and make sure that your customers love what it is that you have to offer and this is proven from repeat business if you have repeat business then you know that what you're doing is right but when you start small um, you're able to get feedback from your customers um, and begin with your current contacts. Sell your products at local artisan markets and seasonal fates, events, exhibitions. This is what I used to do when I started at Arte Market in Dubai and I was selling my products and the feedback that I got was incredible. I started with an absolutely gigantic range of products. It was ridiculous. People were like, oh my God, you make all this yourself? This is like... <sighs> but then what happened over time is that I ended up being able to narrow it down because I saw what the best sellers were and what my customers really liked. And then I ended up like shelving 90% of what it is that I had um, and concentrating on my best sellers. Um, so you need to gather, excuse me, you need to, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, you need to gather consumer feedback and improve the things that are not quite right. Um, and Chanel has stood the test of time because they stay on trend. OK, they've got a lot of money behind them, um, but they stay on trend without being gimmicky. And they offer this timeless elegance. Um, and you have to look at your competitors. I do it constantly. Uh, competition is healthy and it keeps you on your toes. If there is competition, great. Why? Because that means that there is a demand for what you're about to do or what you are doing. If there's if you've got no competitors and there's nobody ever in the whole world doing anything what you're about to do, there might be a reason for that. Maybe there's no demand for it at all, <laughs> unless you have really reinvented the wheel. Um, but what are your competitors doing that you can do better? And this is what I do as well. I look at my competitors and I look at their pricing strategies. I look at the content that they're uh, offering and I look at what they're doing wrong and I'm like, right, OK, I can do so much better than that. Or they're doing that. I'm not going to do that because they can do it so much better than I can. So um, always, always look at your competitors and see what they're doing. But don't copy. Please don't copy anything that they're doing. You need to be inspired. Have a look at fashion designers, how they are inspired by other designers around the world. Um, but they don't copy them. Use that inspiration and channel it into your own creativity. Point number four is know your numbers. Cash is king. And Jo Malone's husband once told her, if you're not making a profit, you don't have a business. You have to price your goods accordingly and factor in all of the things that you might think are insignificant at first, but it all adds up and that includes your time. Perfumes have one of the biggest markups ever, so don't be shy with your pricing. The right customer will pay the price if they really want it, as long as the price is reflected in the quality. Who are your competitors and what do they charge? Can you be as competitive or were you going to charge more? But you need to justify your reasoning for this and be confident with your decision. 
it's easier to reduce prices than it is to increase them. So start on the high side. This way it's giving you wiggle room and also you can offer customers loyalty discounts and rewards. And once you've proven your business model works and makes a profit, you can reinvest money into scaling up, getting into retail outlets or opening your own physical store. Learn from the experts. Point number five. Some people want to start their own business, but don't factor in any budget for training, especially when it comes to perfumery. Um, And don't consider training as an expense, but consider it as a long term valuable investment in your business. You need to be knowledgeable about your industry and be taken seriously by your customer. You can read all the free blog posts you want and go on all of these free forums and you can read every single book about perfumery, but that's going to take you an exceedingly long time and time spent on reading conflicting information or even like receiving bad advice is time you could have spent on quality training, building your brand and making money. Now, it sounds like I'm pushing my Accent Academy here. I promise you I'm not. Um, And there are several reputable schools like mine. Uh, where you can learn either online or in a classroom setting. You can expect to pay from $500 to $2,500 for a short course. And if you want to do the formal training, it's going to cost you around €30,000 for uh, two years of formal training, unless you go with uh, perhaps companies like Givadon or Isipka, uh, where you have to then work for them after the training for, I think, at least two years. So they get the money back. Um, But they take on very few people each year. Somebody once told me that Givadon only choose seven people every two years. Um, But yeah, check the curriculums uh, to ensure that you're going to get what you need out of it. Uh, Now I have a diploma course and that's for people mostly really that want to um, learn how to make their own perfumes. Um, But then you might have someone that's going to make the perfume for you or you're going to collaborate with the perfume house. Either way, you still need fragrance 101 i have a fragrance 101 course um online and it's like under 30 dollars and it will teach you the basics because even if you're going to collaborate with a perfume house and you're going to make amazing fragrances and a lot of people that get into the industry maybe don't even know anything about perfume or aromatherapy um but as long as you have the basics you know what perfumes are you know how they're structured you know the science behind it you know how they're composed etc you can understand the difference between fragrance families fragrance themes top note heart note base note if you've got all of these fundamentals down pat then you can talk to your customer with conviction and then your customer is going to trust you more so even if it's just a really short course even there's courses on udemy um I've actually got one on there as well, which I use for marketing purposes. Um, But you need to really understand your industry. Um, But relying on random blogs and forums can be a little bit like the blind leading the blind. So try to avoid doing that. I've had so many people that have come to me and said, oh, my God, I can't believe I spent years like doing what you've told me not to just now. Um, and what that I've learned from you in even a day, I learn more in a day with you than I did over like three years of fumbling around in the dark. If you listen to my previous podcast about scent snobbery, there's a lot of snobbery in the fragrance industry and self-taught perfumers are often not taken seriously by the industry, especially by classically trained perfumers who can be, not all of them, but you know they can be incredibly snobby and they only believe that if you're classically trained, can you ever be a perfumer? My friend... Um, Vincent, Dr. Vincent of Reminiscent Parfum, he is self-taught. He's a chemist, but he's a self-taught perfumer. He has an incredible brand. And I asked him about self-taught perfumers and how are they considered seriously? And he said, really, in his opinion, self-taught perfumers are considered seriously from the moment they make commercially successful fragrances. So don't let the snobbery put you off. Point number six, get good sources. I can't stress enough how important it is to get good, reputable sources that you can build a trustworthy relationship with because then you'll know that the products they offer are of the highest quality. Do not be fooled by terms like therapeutic grade. This is a marketing ploy and all essential oils 
are therapeutic. They all have therapeutic properties. Unless they're going into the food industry, then they just want it for the flavor. Then that's something completely different. But when you're buying essential oils that have the Latin name, etc., I'm going to do a podcast about what to look for with essential oils. I will do that in the next episode, I think, because that's incredibly interesting. But when you're contacting new suppliers, ask for the country of origin, ask for the specifications, ask for the MSDS, uh, the material safety data sheet for the oils that you're interested in. You can ask for documentation um, that they have for these oils. And especially uh, you probably won't get this if you just go into like a Neil's Yard shop, you know, um, or the body shop. Oh my God, that's closing down, isn't it, in the UK now? Um, but if you go into like a little shop, they're not going to give you this. But I'm talking about when you're buying online and you're buying from wholesalers and you're buying in bulk, they should have no problem whatsoever giving you this documentation. Get this. There's more lavender oil in the world than is ever actually harvested, which goes a long way to tell you how much lavender oil out there is fake. And it's true of carrier oils as well. One thing I do to test the quality of essential oils is with a new supplier. If they sell jojoba oil, I buy a sample. I, I get a sample of jojoba oil from them, put it in the fridge. If it doesn't go solid, it's not jojoba oil. If that thing is not solid after one or two days, then it's not jojoba oil. And then I wouldn't touch that supplier with a barge pole. Uh, but there's lots of things that you look for, you need to look for in essential oils. If you're just buying essential oils um, and you're just using naturals, uh, you need to always look for the Latin name. But that's going to be another bo- podcast. It's imperative that you get good suppliers. I went to the perfume souk in Dubai once and that guy in one of the shops, I asked him about this. Um, he showed me, oh, come and smell my lavender. He said, <laughs> I said, OK. And I just smelt it. And because of the experience that I have, um, I knew that it wasn't lavender just from smelling it. It wasn't natural. It was a synthetic. And I told him this and he would like, he would swear on his mother's life that this was natural and real lavender oil. Now, whether he believed it to be that or not, I don't know, but um, you can't pull the wool over my eyes. So you need to understand what's real and what's not. Point number seven, use the right equipment and use it right. If you work with inferior or like rubbish equipment, it's only going to hinder your progress and your creativity. Plus, it will drive you crazy when it goes wrong. Knowing something as simple as which pipette to use and how to use them correctly is going to set you off on the right foot. Scales are another thing. Don't You can't use kitchen scales. You need to use like jewellery scales. You don't, if you don't have the budget for perfumer scales, which can cost upwards of 400 euros, then you can use fine jewellery scales. And I always recommend that you would get German or Japanese ones. They're more reliable than Chinese. Chinese made ones and they have to have at least two decimal points so therefore when it's on the scale it would read at 0.01 better if you can get it to 0.001 but two decimal points is fine and they must have a weight capacity with at least 200 grams so they can carry something on the top that's at least 200 grams if you can go for 500 grams it's going to cost you more Um, and that means when you put a perfume bottle on a scale if it's more than 500 grams it's not going to read Uh, the weight so um, and then you always have to calibrate your scales as well before you use them and often you will get calibration um, weights the little weights that you can get they can be bought separately or sometimes they come as a package and you need to practice as well using your scales don't use your oils to practice using your scales you can just use water initially to practice using your scales because um, using your alcohol or any of your oils to practice how to use your scales because they're very fine and very sensitive Um, you should just use water initially because it's going to be a massive waste of money for using expensive oils Now, we've talked about suppliers. Point number eight is use quality materials. Once you've found now, so let's say you've now got a reliable and trustworthy supplier for your oils, when you do, stick with them. You don't have to stick to one supplier. You can have several because perhaps they'll sell, you'll have someone that might sell uh, isolates, uh, aroma chemicals, and another one that sells beautiful essential oils and absolutes. You can, but stick with them and build a good relationship with them. That's incredible, uh, incredibly important. Um, 
because they will often have different varieties of lavender rose, jasmine, lang lang, for instance. Um, and the best lang lang in the world comes from the Comoros Islands because they distill the super extra grade. Um, but you might want to use lower grades of Ylang Ylang. Um, Rose Absolute and Lavender Absolute are preferable oils to work with rather than the essential oils because um, not only are the colours beautiful, but the aroma profile is far richer and rounder and more complex compared to the essential oil. So you need to consider high quality food, um, like high quality food. You know, if you want to make like a beautiful dish, that you're going to eat and put into your gorgeous mouth and tantalize your taste buds with these incredible flavors. You need good quality ingredients for your food. And it's the same. And I've got a little quote here from Mandy Aftal, who I interviewed, a natural perfumer based in Berkeley, California. And she said, if you have a vine grown tomato, that's a terrific variety at the peak of ripeness, that tomato salad is going to be better. So the difference in your fragrance when you work with the best oils that you can find is incomparable. And again, in the words of Mandy Aftal, when you start with great ingredients, you have a running head start to make something good. Not just good, great. You must use incredibly good quality oils because that will make a huge difference to the final result of your fragrance. Please don't think about skimping. Perfumery is the most profitable, one of the most profitable businesses in the world. So trust me when I tell you, you might think, oh my God, I'm spending how much on these oils? That's ridiculous. You're actually going to be using very little of them. So for you to have inferior oils, and charge a high amount. It's almost like you're conning your customer. So don't do that. Exceptional quality, you will be able to tell the difference. Your customers, they're quite discerning. A lot of customers trust me and they know their noses and they will be able to see and smell the difference between inferior and superior oils. Fragrance oils are a no-no, point number nine. Once you get good sources and learn about your materials, you'll understand that fragrance oils are not for fine perfumes or any other products that are left on the skin. Fragrance oils are for candles, room fragrances, soaps and other wash-off products. The difference between fragrance oils and essential oils is like night and day. There's a vast difference between hand soaps and shower gels and products that stay on your skin, like lotions, oils or perfumes. Fragrances are not suitable for any of the latter. And there's a difference when you look at uh, when you're getting products tested. The cosmetic chemist will ask you what kind of a product is it? And you're allowed more leniency with the ingredients if it's a wash off product like a shower gel or a soap, as opposed to if it's a body oil or a body lotion that's going to stay on the skin. And if you try to get away with using cheap fragrance oils, you will pay for it dearly and you'll never be able to retail them. Please don't skimp on your ingredients. Know what you're using, know what their uses are suitable for and a reputable supplier will tell you what that oil is deemed suitable for. So if it's suitable for only a candle or a room spray, please don't try to put it into a body oil (laughs) unless you want your customer to come out in rashes and sue you. And look at the prices as well. If a rose oil or a lavender oil costs a dollar or two, you can guarantee that it's a synthetic fragrance oil and it's never seen a flower in its life. So look for suppliers who specialize in fine fragrance perfumery ingredients and not candle fragrances. Point number 10 is know your materials and understanding your materials is the most fundamental part of perfumery. The same way a designer must know their materials, so a perfumer must be familiar with theirs. Getting familiar with your raw materials, when I say raw materials, it means your oils, your ingredients. And getting familiar with them will enable you to identify them from smell alone. So practice smelling every day, the same way a musician practices with their instrument every day. You need to understand your materials, not just the smell, but the way they interact with each other. What works well with what and what doesn't? Again, liken it to cooking. What 
herb goes well with fish? What herb goes well with chicken? It's the same with perfumery. <laughs> Talking about chicken, do you know, I was once approached by a PR company in Dubai asking me to make a perfume that smelled like KFC. <laughs> I thought they were joking. I honestly thought I was being punked, but it's true. And then when I like Googled it, there is actually a suntan lotion that smells like Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Imagine lying on a beach and smelling like KFC. The seagulls would love you for it. Anyway, so going back to knowing your materials, you can only achieve knowing your materials by practicing and creating like small experiments. So certain oils, like I've just mentioned, um, um, the uh, certain oils will enhance specific aspects of another. So for instance, ambroxan, which is synthetic ambergris, is used not because uh, the smell is the same as ambergris, because if you smell the two, the smells are very quite different but it's actually used for how it interacts with oils because it has the same effects as natural ambergris um, in a perfume formulation and you'll be able to decide very quickly which ingredients work well together and which don't and once you've gained sufficient experience you're going to be able to make informed decisions about which oils to use and have more conviction in your approach to perfume making and be confident enough to take the next step and start creating. We call it training your nose, but really it's training your brain, your nose brain, um, your olfactory bulb. Um, your nose is actually the only open pathway to your brain. Did you know that? And your olfactory bulb sits like on the outside of your brain. So it's almost like a little part of your brain is like falling out. <laughs> Sounds disgusting, but it's about training your nose brain. And this is just, um, it's just about understanding your materials, really. And um, when you know what your materials, you know, when you're making a perfume and you're like, oh, do you know what? You know, you've got a, when you're making a curry and you're like, oh my God, it's too acidic. What am I going to do? I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put some sugar in it because that gets rid of the acidity. Or even when I make a butter chicken and my husband still finds it too hot, we'll put some yogurt in it. So once you understand these little nuances, in perfumery apply that to your perfume blend and you'll know it's lacking richness it's lacking freshness and you'll know which oils to go to to be able to rectify that and modify your perfume so understand your materials and the final part in perfumery 101 part one <laughs> the final point is number 11 because we're splitting this into two, because otherwise it'll end up a two-hour podcast, is have a goal and stick to it. The core to creating your own perfume is having an objective. And, you know, you don't just go into a lab and start mixing nice-smelling oils haphazardly, um, you know, and hoping for the best. You need to think about it. Imagine you're sitting behind the wheel of your car and you're intending to drive somewhere, but you've got no clue where you're going. Or how you're going to get there. You don't know where the route is and you don't know where you're going, but you're just going to be sitting behind the ha you're just going to be sitting behind your wheel, aren't you? Aimlessly going, what am I doing sitting here? <laughs> but if you don't have a destination in mind and a route to get there, um, you might end up going somewhere incredible. I've done it before. I've just got in my car and started driving and ended up getting lost and ended up somewhere amazing. Or, you know, more dramatically, you might just end up driving off a cliff. <laughs> And the same holds true when you're making a perfume. You need to have a goal in mind and decide what you're trying to create. Um, it's really easy to get carried away from all the excitement of launching products and getting into making perfumes. And you, you get so excited, you lose sight of what it is that you're creating. And putting your ideas into words will keep you focused on your objective. Now, you can write yourself a brief People talk about vision boards. They talk about mind maps. You don't need to have a mind map. You don't need to have a vision board. You might just be inspired by a single ingredient. Like I am inspired by Ilang Ilang from the Comrades Islands. Why am I inspired by it? Because it's one of the most superior grades of Ilang Ilang. I have a professional business relationship with the uh, actual distiller called Mahmoud in the Comrades Islands who developed a sustainable way of distilling the oil. And that's my personal story with him. So I don't need to do a mind map or a vision board about it. I already understand 
that I want to create a perfume based around this oil. So that's a simple brief for myself now. Now I might get inspired by the country. Maybe I want to go and visit and go to the Commerce Islands and be inspired by other smells there, perhaps. Or maybe I just want something that's just so knock your socks off sexy uh, with this ilang ilang that I'm just going to base it all around there. And because I know my materials, I know what oils are going to work well with it. And perfume briefs can range from 100 pages to and this is talking about global brands now where they do um they do you know lots of market research and test studies um and things like that but if you look at writing a brief that's 100 pages long or having a single sentence focus groups that's the word i was trying to think of they do lots of focus groups as well so a lot of money spent in um in you know launching new perfumes there's an interesting documentary um I think it's a BBC documentary on YouTube and it's a two-part one um, and it's talking about where they're launching a new Lynx fragrance in Brazil and the focus groups that they use there before they actually decide on the fragrance um, and they're testing that fragrance on focus groups. Um, so that's a lot of effort that's going into, um, you know, the launch of that perfume. But if you look at J'adore by Dior, that apparently was created from a single sentence brief Create a perfume as sexy as a pair of stilettos, but as comfortable as a pair of tods. And when you smell that perfume, you get it instantly. The light bulb goes off and you're like, oh, it is sexy, like a pair of Le Bouton stilettos, but it's so comforting as well. And it's just a beautiful fragrance. Um, so yeah, I love that. And it, not having an objective, it's like going on a journey without planning how to get to your destination. And I am going to Milan next week for a perfume expo and I know how I'm going to get there. I know why I'm going and I know how I'm going to get there. I bought my plane, I've booked my hotel, I've booked the things that I'm going to do while I'm there. So, you know, I have a plan because that's my destination and you need to kind of think of it like that if you like planning holidays. Um, but don't over complicate it. You know, like I said, you can just be inspired by a, a single ingredient like I am. If you want to use mood boards, you can or sketches. Lots of designers do that. The visuals will help to clarify your ideas and help you determine which oils you need as well. Um, you can do mind mapping if you just Google uh, Tony Buzan, Tony B. And then Buzan, B-U-Z-A-N, and look at his mind mapping. You can see how to mind map that everybody, everybody thinks in different ways and everybody plans in different ways. So there's no one set rule. It might be a 20 page brief. It might be a 10 page. It might be a one sentence. It might be a mind map. It might be a vision board. It, uh, but, but get focused on it and then don't start thinking about your next perfume, your next perfume. Because if you don't have a clear aim, it's really easy to get lost. But every step of the way when you're creating your fragrance, now whether it's for perfumery or for an aromatherapy blend or both combined, a feel-good fragrance, at every step you need to consciously recall why are you adding those oils? Don't let it become a mille fleur, a, a thousand flowers, um, which is what perfumers call when they put all of their samples together and put them in one jar. They call it a mille fleur. Um, and it ends up being incredibly muddy, uh, dirty, um, like a muddy painting um, with too many colours in it. You don't want to do that. You need to use your oils with intention. And if you're not adding them with intention, what are they doing? What are they bringing to the perfume party? That's what you need to understand. Um, because otherwise you're going to add a drop of this and a drop of that and lose sight of your fragrance. And this is why now you've got good suppliers, you've got a good quality ingredients, you've got an objective, you know what it is that you want, you understand what perfumery is, you've learned about it, or even like just the fundamentals, especially top heart base notes and what they bring to a perfume. You understand your materials and how they work and interact with each other and how they can enhance and be, you know, modify certain blends that are lacking a certain je ne sais quoi. Um, you're using these oils with intention now. So can you see how everything that I've just talked about so far is leading up to this point now? 
And if at any point you feel that the perfume isn't working, you can take a step back and look again at the brief and remind yourself of what it is that you wanted to accomplish in the first place. This is going to guide you back towards your objective. If it's really not working, start again and learn from the mistakes that you've made so far. Don't keep going down that rabbit hole of thinking that you can rectify it. Get rid of it. Let it be a lesson to you. Make notes of what you've done, why it's not worked, and swear to yourself that you're never going to make that mistake again. Learn from it. As long as you learn from it, that's okay, isn't it? We all make mistakes every single day. Um, but this is always when you look at when you step back and look at your brief again, keep reminding yourself what it is, you go back to your objective. So if it's really not working, start again and learn from the mistakes that you've made so far. If I want to go out and buy a pair of boots, but then I get distracted by, you know, the handbag shop, um, then I've not got myself a pair of boots, you know, and I've got blisters on my feet because I'm using the old ones that have got holes in them. Uh, But I've got a really nice handbag. Yeah, but that wasn't your objective. You were supposed to go out, Melanie Jane, and buy some new boots because you do... (laughs) because you really need some new ones. Um, So can you see now, um, you don't go off on a tangent and and staying on it, it's going to take longer than you expected perhaps, but the result is going to be better than you ever dreamed. Plus the view along the way (gasps) will be incredible. And just as a designer can't put all of their ideas into one dress, don't put all of your ideas into one perfume Make notes of other ideas and put them into creations at another time. Perhaps you have ideas for other fragrances. For instance, I'm going to be launching a range of fragrances towards the end of 2024, um, as well as the solid perfumes that I have in my vintage pill boxes. And these are, I've got so many ideas. And of course, I've just revealed one of them, which is the Ylang Ylang based fragrance. But I've got ideas for the other ones as well. Now, I'm not saying just work on one perfume at a time, but I am saying work on one perfume at a time. (laughs) Now, same, same, but different. Now, you get perfumers in perfumers houses and perfume houses. And of course, they would never get any work done. And they would never be able to satisfy any of their customers if they only focused on one perfume and then waited until that perfume was perfect and then move on to the next one. You can work on several projects simultaneously, but whilst you're focusing on one perfume and you're making it and you're in that creative process of developing that perfume, don't get sidetracked by the other perfumes that are in your little book that you're going to work on. You can work on that one tomorrow. Today, you're focusing on this one. So that's it for Perfumery 101, part one. Don't lose track of where you're going. But can you see how all of this now, it's all come together um, up until this point now where you're now going to start creating amazing fragrances because you've got the foundation and having the foundation of knowledge to start creating is like the engine room of your perfume brand. And you have to have that because if you don't have that knowledge, then you're just setting yourself up for failure and you need to be ahead of your competition because there are other people that will be in the same headspace as you right now wanting to start their own brand and they're willing to put the work in and they're willing to invest and they're willing to do it properly and if you don't and they do then they are going to take your customers away from you and you don't want that do you nobody wants that Okay, so tune in for the next podcast, which will be Perfumery 101, part two. You see, I'm glad that I split this into two because otherwise this would have turned into an hour and a half podcast. And really, you know, you've probably got better things to do, but I hope it was valuable and um, I'll see you next time. A bientôt, stay fabulous. Mm-hmm.